start back here, get my intermediate target. It's going to be right there. Now I'm coming in. There's my intermediate target right there. Set that club face down at that spot. Make sure I'm lined up properly. Here we go. I don't have to worry about losing this to the right because all I got to do is make sure I hit this solidly and start it on the line I intend. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Solid shot there. Not a lot of curve. Kind of going right at the, whoa, it, wow, it went in the hole. Oh, my God. Yo, oh, no. No, I swear. That drink's on you. Holy cow. Hey, Greg, you got to play that again. You got to play that again. 11 years I've been doing this, and I've never done this before. We took the flag out of the hole. Watch this thing with the tracer on. Bink, bink, right in the hole. Holy cow. All right, hold on a second. I got to calm down. The sixth hole was our first par five on the golf course. It's 523 yards. What does that mean? All the players will be able to reach this in two, provided you can get it in the fairway. What's out there in the fairway? Well, there's a bunker down the left-hand side. The rough is obviously going to be very thick. And this fairway releases towards the water once in the fairway. Now you're hitting to a blind green protected by bunkers. It's very accessible. And I think we're going to see a lot of birdies here come U.S. Open. I'm Michael Breed, so excited for the 119th playing of the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach. I'm going to take you through all 18 holes, give you some insights into what the players are going to face and make it a little bit more enjoyable for you to watch the U.S. Open. This green is kind of pitching almost the way the 17th hole at Pebble Beach is pitched. There's obviously no water on the left-hand side, but you can see it almost looks like a shoe print. As you go there, you can see the heel right there. That's where the hole location is, and it's going back on an angle, about a 45-degree angle. What does that mean? Well, it means that that's almost like having two separate greens. I can get a shot that's pin high to this front right portion of the green, but if I don't hit it at the flag, now I'm going to get into that bunker, and I've got a very difficult bunker shot. I'm expecting to see some really good scores here. I think there will be some birdies, but I also think you might see a few double bogeys. Now, I'm going to give this a shot. I got this thing at playing, what are we playing today? 198. So it's just a little bit under that 200 yard. Got to hit this solidly. Oh yeah. Very solid shot there. Is it going to catch the green? Just kicks off the edge. Settle down. Okay. A good shot for me, one that I'm very happy with. And I know the players will be happy to find the floor here, find the dance floor, give themselves a birdie opportunity. It's going to be a wonderful hole to watch. Welcome to a new breed of golf live. Michael Breed here, excited to be able to help you play great golf from the Morgan Franklin Transformation Center and getting you ready for a weekend. It is, um, it's an exciting time of year because it's getting close to the, to the end, air quotes, end of the season. Up here in the Northeast, we're starting to see some wins. So the game of golf is a little bit different. You're playing shots a little bit lower. You're um, working on your game and the greens are maybe a little bit firmer, firmer, possibly even a little bit faster. The game is changing a little bit, but the swing and the practice isn't. We're going to talk about how you can get control of your shot shape, get control over the six-way miss. I know, six ways. Yeah, it's all lower body. And what it can create is so many different shots. You can start it to the pull side or the push side, and you can spin it to the left or the right off of each one of those. That's how you end up with push right, fade right, pull left, fade right, pull to the, to the left, stay to the left, turn to the left. So many different ways you can get this miss. We're going to solve these miss shots for you. First, let me introduce you to the people that are working behind the scenes, Mr. Greg Ducharme, and of course, Mr. Steve Gibbs, who joins us every single week. Gibbsy, give him a wave there. Yep, we're here having some fun. We're going to get you updated on what's going on on the PGA Tour, the CJ Cup in South Carolina. Greg's going to be giving us that. We're going to get to some of your questions as well, whatever questions you have. But as I said before, today we're going to talk about what's taking place with the lower body and how the lower body um, is affecting the path of the club, the face of the club. A couple of quick reminders. First, we've got our blessed poker chip 
ball markers right here. Yep, you only see five of them. We sold out of the, the, the uh, blue. Now we've got a light blue, the red, the green, the black, and of course the lavender, which happens to be my favorite. Excited to be able to, to get those to you. Only $6. Send an email to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. Also, two, by the way, we've got our pinned range finders. That's exactly right. I've got the black one right here. Fabulous device. We're offering a nice little discount for you. So if you're in the market for a range finder, this one here I think is going to be fantastic. 200 bucks with uh, code breed, and it's got a nice little charger. You don't need to buy the batteries anymore. Batteries are done. One of the best parts about pin golf, the batteries are done. You now just charge it, and one charge gives you 65 rounds. So excited to be able to uh, bring that to you as well. Now, I want to talk to you about why I have, Gibbsy, yeah, there you go. Why I have these gear ties around my knees. And I want to show you with this, there you go. You see how we, we have that sticking out a little bit. When we start to talk about lower body movement, everybody thinks immediately hips. I want you to think knees. I want you to focus on knees and the angle of the knees, how the knees um, affect the, the, the slide or the rotation of the body and how you can start thinking about working your knees to work the rotation into your game. I want to show you what I'm talking about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit a shot here and just explain this to you. So let me go over here to the, the V1. I'm going to hit the record, come back over here, and I'm going to hit a shot. Now this is going to be what I try to do in my golf swing, which is pretty good amount of, of rotation out of the lower body and the upper body. So pretty good rotation, very good shot there. That ball goes about right about 175. So I like that shot a lot. Now let's take a little look at what happens here in this motion and I'm going to get it to impact right there. So call that impact. Okay. Now address position. So in this address position, just because I'm rushing a little bit, my hips are starting right there about six degrees open. Shoulders look a little bit open, so I didn't quite set my posture exactly the way I want. But now what I want you to see is this. Here's impact. And at impact, my hips now are about 27 degrees open. And what you're going to notice is the path of the golf club, if this is the strike line right here, that club is on that strike line for a while, and that ball is starting right on that strike line, okay? So let's just take a little look at what happened with the, the path of the golf club here. So this is an excellent path. That one there is out to in, so I'm coming across it just a little bit, only 0.3 there. Very, very good strike. That ball was right in the center of the club face. So you can see the offset right there, 0.0. .0. Club head speed about 82 miles an hour. That's my that this is what is sort of a normal shot for me. That ball 173 in the air, out to about 176, call it 175 because it's easier to remember. Ball speed right at 116, launch at 186. You all have watched, you know exactly what my numbers look like, but that's what I get out of my normal golf swing. And what you see is my, my knees right there are about 20 something degrees open. Let's go over here for just a second because I want you to pay attention also too to the angle of that gear tie. It's 48 degrees. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten this out just a little bit. And now I'm going to take my knees and I'm going to slide them. So I'm going to get in here and I'm going to drive them towards the target like this. And we're going to watch all the different things that take place. So we'll jump over here, hit this. Now I'm going to slide the knees here. Okay. So knees slide, ball starts out to the right, has a nice little turn to it. Oh yeah right in that basket. So we like that one a little bit. Now, let's first of all, before, before I break this down, let's go over here and look at what happened with the club data. So what we see is instead of 0.3 out to in, now I'm 8.4 
in to out. So I altered the path of the golf club by taking the knees and sliding them. And what ended up happening was I, I might have caught that a little bit fat. Certainly it didn't have the ball speed that, that the other one had. This is 82. This one's 81. So maybe one mile an hour difference. I lost some spin rates. I lost some law. I got, I got a little bit higher launch. I lost some ball speed. That ball speed was down to 112 because of the strike. So let's go over and take a peek at what happened with the body and with the golf club. So I'm going to get back to there's impact right about there. Yeah, that's just past impact there. Okay. All right. So here's a dress this time. I think I did a little bit better job. Yeah, that's about zero. Now let's see what happens. So club goes back, start to bring the club in. You can see the club head now is coming in way from the inside. In fact, if I compare that to what I did in the prior swing, so this being the prior swing, there's the golf club there. So if I draw this line going across like this, and I draw this line going across like this, what you can see is this club head over here is way inside the strike line versus this one. It's about, it's touching that strike line. Similar distances uh, from the golf ball there. Now, let's just go one more. We'll go one more click. And now we're basically at impact here. Now look at the, the, the big differences in how the body is, is working or not working. First thing I want you to pay attention to is here's the mat here. Here's the trail shoulder right here. Over here, both the trail mat and the shoulder are in the, really in a similar, very similar spot. Also too, look at this, because this is, I think, what is so fascinating about it. If I come across from my toe line right here, my trail shoulder is just barely closer to the golf ball than my toe. Over here, look at the difference between where my toe is. I drew a terrible line right there. That's, that's a better one. Look at the difference between where that toe is and where that lead shoulder is. And then the other thing that, I mean, th all these things stick out so much, okay? But look at where my shoulders are here. My shoulders are three degrees shut right there. Here, my shoulders are about, say, eight or 10 degrees open, depending upon how accurate I am in my drawing. And you look at all this, you look at some other things. Look at the amount of the gear tie that I can see down here on this one versus the amount of the gear tie that I can see on this one. It's quite a bit different. Look at where the pocket of my pant is, how, how that's right on the line. Over here, it's off the line. And so what's happened is, is by thinking about my knees, now all of a sudden I get my body to rotate, not just my hips, but actually my upper body as well. And what happens to the path of the club? Well, all of a sudden now, we see the path of the club, one coming dramatically from the inside. So that's going from ball to, to white dot on the club. That's 12 degrees. And if I go middle of the ball here to there, that's about four to five degrees. And I drew that a little bit high on that. So that would be about four or five degrees. It's a big difference. There's a couple other things that I want you to pay attention to, which again, is just gonna, it's gonna stick out to you. Look at my eye lines. You'll see it in the ears. So if I go from ear to ear over here, that's 10 degrees closed. If I go ear to ear over here, that's three degrees open. Just with what's happened with the knees, all of a sudden my body has done different things. And the weight distribution, I could get into that and show you how different and dramatic that is. You see it in the club information that's over there behind me. So what you start to realize is, man, my lower body, my knees in particular, have a huge effect on what takes place with my rotation and my club face rotation. And then also to the strike on that. I didn't even check the strike on that, that golf ball, Greg. Let's see where, where the strike was on that last one. Cause I would imagine it's out on the toe. Yeah. Way out on the toe actually. So we got a lot of little different things that have taken place here. Okay. We put this back to here. Now, one of the things that I will do is, and I will tell you this, you do not, I think I've made my, my, my point here. So I'm going to take this off of this trail one because we don't need this. What I want you to do is I want you to think about using this, this lead knee to get your body 
to stop sliding when you want to hit straight. If you want to curve, let your, your, and I mean hook, you want to let that knee glide towards the target or slightly to the push side of the target. If you want to get a fade or a straighter shot, you want this knee to get out of the way there. So when you get in here, your drill is going to be this. You take the club back, and now all I want you to do is I want you to take this knee, and I want you to feel like you're going to open it up. This trail hip is going to rotate as a result of that, and the hips in the down-the-line view here, the hips will now get into an open position. So in here, feeling that knee really open. I'm going to really try to open this one. Okay. This was, I think, an even better strike, a better motion. Ball speed went to 115, 114. But now what happens to the path of the club? Now all of a sudden it's 1.2 out to in. So I've gone from 0.3 out to in, almost a degree more. And all of a sudden, path of the club is going across. I want to hit a fade. If I want to hit more of a fade, then I'm going to do more of that. And I want you to start thinking about how this knee is going to work and what's going to happen. That knee, I want that knee to go straight back this way. I want it to go right back to the, to the surface hub there. In here like this, push back like that. Let's see what we get. That one there. Let's see what we got over here. Bring this up, this, this, this information on the, the uh, club data. And I got that thing about square there. So, so what happens in time and with practice is you start to realize how the work of the knee affects the club head, how that work of the knee affects the club head. And if you want to hit draws, then what you're going to do is you're going to take that lead knee after it gets rotated this way, and you're going to slide it out to the push side. Slide it out to the push side just like that. When we go and capture this club data, what you're going to see is a dramatically in to out path. And there it is, 10.8 degrees in to out, just by thinking about moving that lead knee. Now, we go to a down the line view, and I'm going to record a down the line view of how that slide of the knees brings the club more from the inside here. So I get set up here like this. I'm going to slide that knee. Watch this club come underneath. Okay. Now, come on up to the hub here. So I'm going to set my shaft plane like this. And now we're going to go. Club goes back. Knee is sliding. Club is underneath that yellow line. The delivery now is well underneath. You can see that that club is right in the trail knee. Look at that club coming from the inside right there. And look at how much rotation there isn't. You can, I mean, you can see, you can't even see my left cheek. It doesn't even look like the knees are that open. How much was that one into out, Greg? That was 7.3 7. 7. 7. into out. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, record the same thing. This time I'm going to fire that knee. You know you're going to see the same thing. You're going to see some real movement of that club running out and uh, in front of the body. So set up here. Now I'm going to really shoot that knee. Watch how this club is going to work out and over here. Now we know that that ball is starting to the left-hand side. We know that that thing is going to fade back to the right. A really good shot. Let's check and see what our club data is. Over here, 1.6 out to in. So now I know Okay, this was good. This ball did what I wanted it to do. Ball speed was at 115. The strike was in the pretty much, well, it's in the heel side. That tells you how much I was working there. In the heel side, club head speed was 82.7, so call it 83. Now let's see what happens here. So I'm going to draw my line, which is right about there. Take this up to the top. Now watch what happens with the club relative to that yellow line. 
Look at that. That club never got out on to the line. So now that club is dead center. Now just take a peek because this is always fun, right? What we have is we have the evidence that comes from, from the about golf sim in the club data, which is fabulous. But now what we also have is from the V1 system, what we have is we have a real ability now to measure up and see what, what the draw looks like versus the, the fade in the knee. Okay, so I'm going to go over here. I'm going to freeze this at impact. Now I'm going to bring this down over here. Club coming from the inside. There's impact right there. So now let's look at these two positions of the golf club as it's being brought down in. And they look like they're in totally different spots. In fact, if I were to go over to this one, and go down one more picture, which is that's pretty close to where um, that that last parallel is on each one. What you can see is, and I got to I got to make a just a little bit more obvious for you. So I'm going to draw a line right here, and then bring it back to there. And what you can see is here's the club right here on top of the plane. Here's the club right here, well under the plane. Big, big differences. You can obviously see the space between the forearms here versus the forearms over here. A lot of that is different. Now come into impact. So now we come into impact and look at how different, let's erase all that stuff. Look at how different the impact positions look. Look at how much space I have over here that you can see to the left of my trail leg. Over here, you barely see any of it. And then how about over here? Look at what's going on in this area over here. Look at how much of my rear I can see there versus how much I can't see over there. And what you realize is, is that as you start thinking about what you're doing with the lead knee, you start to be able to hit whatever shot you want to hit, control the club face however you want to control the club face, and get the start line that you want. One of the reasons why you're hitting six different shots is because you're not getting a consistent movement out of that lead knee and not predictable in the how the, the club is coming into the golf ball. So sometimes the club's coming well from the inside and the face is open or well from the inside and the face is closed. So you'll get a ball that'll start to the right and hook or start to the right and fade. And then you'll get a shot where you, you get the knee out of the way for some reason. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's a downhill lie. I don't know. But it starts to the left and fades, starts to the left, and and goes to the left and so as you start to get left left or left right 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 left all of a sudden now we start getting various different start lines and you can also by the way you can get the one that starts a little bit to the right and turns back to the left and starts a little bit to the left and turns back to the right you can get minor and you can get major and so when you start trying to figure out how to play your best golf think about what you're doing with this lead knee in particular so when i take this thing off now because I'm losing circulation, you start thinking about the importance of this knee. And this, to me, is the whole thing. This is where the sit-down position that Sam Sneed um, had, the broadening of that knee. Well, that knee is basically getting out of the way. So if you go back to, let's just take a little walk through history right here, and let's look at, at this, this uh, sit-down position of, of Sam Sneed's. Because it's really tremendous. Let me get, I gotta get the right one. So let me get the right one here. Here it is. So now you go up to the top here. Here's the lead knee right here. Here's the trail knee right here. Now watch as he starts to bring this club into the downswing. Look at how that lead knee is moving. That lead knee is starting the whole process. And now, his knees, which were this far apart over here, they were this far apart, are now that far apart. And what you can also see is, is that that knee is going to start to, it's, it's now out in front of that hip, which is going to allow that 
that hip or force that hip to rotate back. So what you're going to see is you're going to see this lead knee, which is right here now. Watch this thing move back and straighten. Phenomenal position. Tremendous, tremendous work out of the lower body. I think though this lower body work, probably my favorite lower body work of any golf swing in history. I love the way that that movement looks and obviously the function of it. And so what I want you to do is this. What I want you to do is I want you to think about this lead knee. And I want you to imagine at the top of the swing, it's almost up against a split rail fence right here. So give me a down the line view here too, Gibbsy. So it's against a split rail fence. And what I want you to do is I want you to get this knee away from that fence as best you can. Move it way back off that fence. And when you move it off that fence, what you're going to get is you're going to get a very, very square path and a very quiet club face. So there's the, the swing that I just made there. Now, that one there had a little bit of a draw to it. I started a little bit to the left, only 415 RPMs of left spin. But now we come over here, and this is the part. Go back to that, that uh, club data, if you would, Greg. This is the part that I'm thrilled about. That is 0.2 in down. Basically, that is dead square. So what I created was a dead square path. If I want to hit a fade, well, now all of a sudden, I'm going to do it even more. If I want to hit a draw, now I'm going to let it glide. Pay attention to the lead knee, and you'll start to get control over what's going on with your body. And if you start to think about where that club is bottoming out, if you bottom out too soon and you're hitting it fat and thin, which is the other two shots in this, start left and go left or right, start right and go left or right, or thin or fat, it comes from the knees going forward, not going sideways. What do I mean? Forward that way sideways that way now we all know this is where the game of golf gets a little confusing this is forward towards the target this is backward away from the target but that's also forward and this is also backward so it's hard to say well i want it to go backward because i don't want it to go that way but i do want it to go this way so we'll call it sideways backwards okay let's come up with a, a sideways backwards and so what i want you to do is i want you to feel that knee going boom back like that so we go in like this and then we go, boom, back like that. And now all of a sudden what I get is, again, another extremely good shot, a little quieter face still. That was fairly straight. What's the path of the golf club coming in there? Great, 0.8 out to in, back to my fade. And that's what I'm trying to do with my lower body. I want that knee to be pushing back and away from the strike line so that my body can clear and rotate and my club face can be very, very quiet. I like active body, passive hands. A lot of people are, are playing golf. You might be playing a little passive body, active hands, which is one of the reasons why you're missing the, the strike. That strike on that shot was just a little bit to the toe. But if you look at my average, it's 0.0. .0 like 0, 0.0. I've zeroed out my strike because of what I'm doing with, with my body motion. Okay. All right. Now let's do this. Let's go over if we've got any questions. And by the way, Greg, let's get an update as to what's going on down at Congaree. We do have questions and we do have an update from Congaree. Uh, Lee Hodges leading the way five under on his round today through 16 holes. He's eight under total. Cam Davis is at seven under through nine holes, two under on the day today. Uh, Kurt Kitayama and Trey Mullinax are also at seven under. Yeah. Kurt Kitayama is at six um, and and uh, through six, two under today. And Trey Mullinax just getting going, birdied his first hole. And then a couple of the other names you're interested in, Rory McIlroy shot five under yesterday. He doesn't go off until 101 today. Tom Kim playing in the same group. He's also at five under. Where's Tied Ricky Rory. Fowler? Because I know Ricky had a, a tough go yesterday, three over par after really two of his first three um, rounds were fantastic, or our uh, tournaments were fantastic. Where's Ricky, he now? Ricky's at three over. Uh, he goes at 101. 101. And a remarkably um, disappointing day on the greens for Ricky. He lost over, over three strokes putting, yeah. which is, uh, I'm sorry, lost almost five. 
four point seven. Almost five shots. Wow. Four point seven strokes putting. Okay, so bad day putting. Yeah, bad okay. day for him. John Rahm's also at two under par. There's, okay. a, there's a good group at two under. A lot of golf left. Spieth is also. Uh, he had a, a, a speech was not a, a great day He shot yesterday. four over yeah, yesterday. Four over yesterday. And let's see if he's made any move today. Um, he's two under on the day, two over for the tournament. Okay, good. So yeah, through so eight better. holes. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's jump to some, some questions if you got them. Okay. This is from Paul. My only swing thought for the first two days has been bending and unbending my right elbow. I feel like it keeps me from going out and around my body. Is this a good swing thought? Produces great shots. Well, look, I, I am a fan of any swing thought that produces great shots, great swing thought. That's, I mean, Dr. Breed to emergency. I love that one. But here's what I would also say too. And I think the most important part of this is all trail arms are going to bend and all trail arms are going to straighten. They do. I mean, there's nobody that's swinging a golf club and going like this and hitting it far. It's impossible. We need leverage. And so what we get is we are going to get some trail bend and we are going to lose that bend. The question is, when do you get the bend and when do you, when do you lose the bend? I don't want you to get bend early on. You get bend early on. You have a narrow swing. It creates a very steep angle of attack. You get really poor contact and you get launch angles that are, are very low, right? So if I get in here like this, and I just take this and I just bend this right here like this, right away like this, and then go like that, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a steep angle of attack, a low launch angle. This launch angle here was, yeah, down there in the 18s. And the angle of attack, yeah, it, it, it's probably in the, in the neighborhood of six or seven. So you get, well, that's what you get. What I want is I want you to let it bend naturally and gradually. So I like to have that arm stay straight for the better part of the backswing, say first parallel when the club is parallel to the ground. I want that arm to stay straight. Then it's going to fold up and I want it to feel like it's like at a 90 degree angle between the forearm and the, and the bicep. So we get up here like this. And then what I want you to feel is I want you to feel you maintain that angle and then let it release over on uh, the target side. So if I do that, I'm going to get I'm going to get a higher, a higher trajectory. That one there had a 50 foot apex Yahoo. Now watch what happens when I get a little bit of wide. And then I let that, that release down at the target again, not my cleanest strike that I've ever had. Let's bring that into the corner. Gibbsy drive uh, number four over here. And what you're going to see is my apex there is 83 feet. So it got way up into the air there. What happened over here? This is one of the things, again, I love this. You're trying to hit a draw. We want to get this into out. And now all of a sudden we're two degrees into out. So what we have is we have a very, very um, good movement to the club head by just making sure that, that this stays straight for a little bit, bends gradually and naturally, and then it releases on the target side of the of the golf ball there. Okay? Or um, for for a more consistent motion. And that's what I would say. Like we're begging for consistency. We're all looking for consistency. Well, inconsistency is going to happen when this thing straightens out behind the, the golf ball. It's going to be consistent when it straightens out on the target side of the golf ball. Very simple to understand. So yeah, I love the swing thought. Just make sure you know when and what is going on with that arm. Okay. This one's from Ian. Um, he says, Super Show as always. I continue struggling to take the club back outside the target line and opposite downswing in to out. Need drills to stop this. Sometimes it leads to fat and thin shots. So say that again. Is he taking the yeah. club outside and then bringing it back from the inside? I continue to struggle taking, uh, I guess that means to take the club back outside the target line and opposite the downswing into out i need drills to stop this so i think he's taking the club outside in the uh backswing and inside in the downswing and it's causing fat and thin shots okay okay so then what i would do is and i look i love these gear ties it, it just all you got to do is go down to one of the home improvement stores 
um, get yourself some gear ties. The two footers are fine. If you, if you want to get smaller than that, that's fine as well. You don't need the six footers, but what you do with the gear tie is you just create some obstacles. So here's a gear tie here and I'll twist this up here like that. And then we'll put that right there. Hold on. I got a, takes a little bit of configuring on the, on the gear tie to get it to, to get it to sit. So that's what I do there. Now, if you go down the line here, Gibbsy, what you can see is if I take this club too much to the inside, I'm going to hit this gear tie right here. So what I want to do to miss the gear tie is take it out here. And then when I come down, I want to miss the gear tie this way. So if you're getting too much from the inside, put this gear tie and block the inside. And so now what happens is I take it here and then I make sure I keep it out here. So I go here and there. And now I get the ball to start over to the pull side. And I do it again. And, and what I will tell you about these drills is when you struggle with, with the drill, that means you need to work on the drill. If, if it's easy for you, don't do the drill. Not that it can't help, but don't do the drill. If the drill's difficult, then do the drill because it's going to teach you stuff. So block the inside. And then you start to go. And this is a drill, frankly, that I'll do a lot. I, I have a couple of go-to drills that I like. This being one, one of my favorite drills. And then the other drill that's, that is, this is my go-to drill. I, I will do this drill. If I don't do this every day, I do it at least four times a week. I put that golf ball forward in my stance and it forces me to go move up there and get that ball. And then I got to make sure that when I do this drill, I don't let it hook. It'll start left, but it can't hook. And so what I get is I get a golf ball that starts left and then moves back to the right. And what it forces me to do is use my upper body and rotate my upper body because sometimes what I'll get is, and the reason why that why we talked about this lower body thing, sometimes what I get is I get some drive out of that lower body. My upper body gets frozen. So for me, this is a combination of upper body going this way and then the lower body, specifically that lead knee, going back like that. Okay? All right. This is from Ted. Michael, how can I smooth out the transition? I feel like I'm lunging at the ball from the top. Okay, so lunging at the ball, just so just let's listen to this. Lunging at the ball is not a lower body thing. It's not a hands thing. It's an upper body thing. So the upper body is lunging. It's not rotating. It's diving down. Well, one of the things that you got to do is you got to make sure that you get control over what you're doing with the, the lower body. Okay. The second thing is, and one of my favorite drills in this situation, one of my favorite drills is pausing at the top. And pausing at the top takes the rush out of a golf swing. And when I mean rush, I mean you get up here and you want to get there quickly, and it's a lunge to this. You want to you want to take some of that out. And so what you do is you get up here to the top, pause, and then swing through. It's it's a wonderful drill. It's really, really difficult. It, I'm telling you, it's one of the hardest drills for you to do. It's tremendously difficult to do. That's why you do the drill. So you get set up. By the way, don't do this drill and expect great shots. Right, It's not going to happen. You're going to hit shots you've never even seen before. But what you're going to do is you're going to get a feel of the softness of the start of the downswing. And what you're going to what you're going to start to feel is a patience, which is what the whole thing is. You're going to feel this patience. And when you feel this patience, now you can create gradual acceleration, which I love. So then when you do that, you have that pause there, you've done that drill, now all of a sudden you realize the speed is happening this way, but there's also a rotation out of this. So we start to get into this. The lunge is here. The lunge is not here. So we get our, our patience. And now all of a sudden, the club can generate speed to and through the golf ball. And then you start getting some, 
you get some distance and you get some good outcome. Okay. Interesting question. All right. Yeah. You need a, any testimonial on that drill. Tiger and Butch Harmon did that drill when they first started working together. Uh, and Tiger said he hated it, by the way. You know what? Most people hate drills that they struggle doing. Yes. <laughs> so it, it speaks to the challenge it's of it okay and the effectiveness. To, it's okay to hate a drill. It is okay to hate a drill because what happens, it means it's something that you need to do. It's like, it's like homework. You got to do it. You get, you get smarter. It's not fun, but you got to do it. All right. This is from Joel in Indiana. Uh, the difficulty is always, are the knees reacting to other body parts or are the knees the driver of the body movement? How are you sure that the knees are the driver? Um, how are you sure? Because you can tell by what happens with the shot shape. That's how you, that's how you can tell the only thing that might, that it might come out of the foot, frankly, the foot might, the foot might be something that, that starts it. There might be a little bit of a, of a twist out of it. It might come out of your mind. I, I'm telling you, but what I know is this, if you think about taking your knee and going that way with it, your hip is not going to go that way. Nobody's knee is going to go back and have the hip go forward. Anatomically, it's just not going to work. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to work. Like your knee, my knee will bend that way. It's not going to bend this way. I'm not going to bend it this way. If it bends that way, I'm probably on my way to a hospital. Okay. So what I would tell you is, is that, is it the knee? I, I don't know. It might be the ankle, but everybody forever through time has said ground up. So we start talking ground up. Knee to me is, is right there. And I think that the knee allows or prevents the hips to work properly. That's what I believe. So I know if I try to take my hip and rotate my hip, I know my knee has to do that. So my knee is going to allow my hip to go. So when I take that knee and I push it away, when I push this away, I guarantee you this trail knee is going to go that way. They're not going to both go like that. You get one going this way and the other one's going that way. And the hips are going to rotate. And the balance is going to be fantastic because you're taking the knee and chucking it back that way. It drives the weight of the, of uh, the lead foot into the lead heel. And the only way that you can take that knee and go back that way. I, I, I don't know exactly what's going on with the neurons and the dopamine and uh, all those different things that are taking place. Synapses. I can't tell you exactly what's taking place, but here's what I know. The only way that knee can go that go that way is if I have a little bit, there's a little bit of ground work from my foot to make that happen. My brain says something down somewhere and something goes that way and the knee goes, is the knee doing it or is the foot doing it? Wrong guy. What I can tell you is, is that when that knee goes that way, my hip is going to rotate. My, my uh, trail hip is going to spin out. Like all this stuff is going to go like that. Once this knee goes like that, it's going to happen. And it's a simple thing to do. And the reason why is because your knee basically does, it goes this way. It can go this way a little bit, but it basically, when you straighten it, it's going back from a bent position to a straight position. It goes back. It's not like it, it's like hands have a lot of different motions that they can create, right? Thumbs can move to pinkies and, and we can make fists and fingers and all these other things. And they all can work. There's a lot of different things that are going on with this knees. They got like one option. They're kind of going this way or this way. That's what they're doing. And so just use one of the two options. Get in there. Don't fight it. I don't have to think about, I don't have to think about the knee uh, or, or the hip sliding and then rotating back. I don't have to think about that. All I have to do is think about taking that lead knee and sending it back that way. And it'll straighten. Hips are going to rotate. The weight distribution is going to be fantastic. Ball speed is going to be high. Center strike is going to be good. It's very, very simple. So make it simple. Go ahead. Okay, this is from Frank. What is the best cure for driver hooks? Um, so let me get a driver. So the best cure for hooking a driver uh, this just, you know how you, these questions come in and you know how there's always the bad answer. I would say this is a bad answer. Well, this is going to be another bad answer, but here's the way I like to solve 
almost all my problems, almost all my problems. And that is fix it before the club goes into motion. So if I'm hitting hooks, my club face is closed or closing. So what I like to do is, I again, hook for me is left. If I don't want it to go left, I rotate my grip to the left. So if I stand here like this and I set my grip like this, I there's no way I can hit a hook. It's, it's not possible. My hands cannot rotate that much to be able to take this grip and make it go left. I'm going to aim to the, to the left here because this is going to go anywhere but left. I'm going to try to hit this left. It, it, it can't go left. In fact, it's, it can't go left. The sim can't even pick it up. That's how left it can't go. Let's try that again. Let me see if I can get that again. Sorry. Is that in the green now? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So now I'm going to really weaken this. So my left hand to the left, my right hand to the left. I'm going to aim to the left and now, and that's me trying to hit a hook. That club face came in. I don't even know how open it spun 860 RPMs to the right. I mean, it isn't going to the left. I'm telling you right now, it can't go to the left. So what's the easiest way to get rid of the hook? Rotate your hands to the hook side, hook left, rotate them left. If you're a lefty hook is right. Rotate them to the right. It's the e that's the easiest way to do it. The easiest. Go ahead, Gregory. This is a topic that seems to keep on coming up from Steve. Hey, fellas, great show. Going off topic, Chinese, Japanese, then Italian. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, that's the gift that keeps on giving. It keeps on giving. Okay. All right. Here's a real question. Great show, guys. Need more of an emotional or mental tip? Let's say me and a partner, let's call him Greg, lost a rough match this week. How do we pick up the pieces and re-enter society? Okay. But it, seriously, how do you get, what do you do after a, after a bad or disappointing round? Okay. So the first thing that I would tell you is, and I, I love this question. The first thing I would tell you is you have to have a philosophy. That you've got to have a swing philosophy. What's your swing philosophy? So my swing philosophy is this. One, club face, club face, club face. Most important thing. So all of the things I'm doing, I'm trying to control the club face. My other swing philosophy is active body, quiet hands. That's club face. I want quiet hands. I want my body to quiet the club face down. So that's one of my philosophies. So I hang on to that stuff. And then I start looking at what did the ball do? Was it hooking or fading? Was it fat or thin? Was it a toe or a heel or a center strike? What was going on with all that? Was I able to move my body the way I want to move my body? If I'm not able to move my body properly, I know I'm bent over too much. If my swing feels quick, I know I'm bent over too much. If my swing feels short, I know I'm bent over too much. And in my game, I know I never stand too tall. I always bend over too much. If, I, if I'm erring, I'm erring too, too much bent over. And so I look at what my typical errors are. When I have ball position problems, what does it tend to do? It can tend to get a little bit too far forward. What does that do? It tends to open up my shoulders, open up my hips, which can tend to allow my hips to drive a little bit more. So I look at all the things that I, I know my tendencies are, but they all boil down to what my philosophy is. I want the club to be passive. And I want my, my uh, swing flaws to be solved before the club is in motion. So I played really good for a little while. Then I had a bad round. What happened? Well, was I taking a big divot or, a, or a, a thin divot? Taking a big divot, I'm bent over too much. Thin divot, now I'm falling out of the shot a little bit, okay? So I, I think about that stuff. If I, if I um, have a situation where I'm getting a lot of toe strikes, toe strikes to me happen when I stand up through the shot. Why am I standing up through the shot? Because I'm bent over a little bit too much. So when I get get bent over here, we go down the line. I get bent over too much. When I start to come into the, to the strike, now my body stands up like this. The handle stands up, the toe drives into the ground and I hit it off the toe. That's one thing. The other thing that can happen is that I'm bent over too much and my body doesn't stand up, but I'm, I'm bringing the club so much from the inside that I strike it off the toe. Either way, I'm bent over too much. So I just look at what my tendencies are 
And then I allow the information to kind of bring me back. My philosophy is always the same. The information that I that takes place is it low or is it high? Is my trajectory low or high? Is it starting left or starting right? Is it hooking or is it fading? Is the strike any good or is it not any good? Am I losing my balance? Is my hand, like I have a tendency now because of my knee, I will make swings where my, my trail hand comes off the ball. I mean, off the club. And I know what happens to me is when that happens, I tend to slide my body. I get stuck here and my right hand can't get through. And so I, my right hand comes off the club. And so at that point, my next thought is, okay, I got to get that knee to work back. I got to get my chest to work forward. And so when I work it back and work it forward, now all of a sudden my hands stay on the club. And when my hands stay on the club, now all of a sudden I know that that worked. So I pay attention to what my swing philosophy is. I allow the information that's taking place in a round of golf to tell me how to get back to back to normal. And by the way, you need to be able to do this because even you can't play perfect golf every day. You just can't. Look at what happens with, with Ricky Fowler. Ricky Fowler plays great golf in his opening uh, tournament, and then he misses the cut. And then he plays great golf in his, in his next tournament at the Zozo. And what happens? First round out, he shoots three over. So understand you're not a machine. You're not perfect. You're not going to, you're going to fail, but you have to have an educated response to what went on. Well, in order for you to know what the educated response is, you got to know what went on. And then once you know what went on, now you can figure out, okay, well, then this means that this happened, then this happened, and then you can put the wheels back on. Okay? Good question. All right. This is from Joe. With winter almost here, tighter lies in the fairway are right behind. Is there any changes to the swing for iron shots off of tight lies? Um, so the answer is no, but... If you, if you get a little bit nervous about it, which is clear that you are, then what I would do in a tight lie situation is I would just move it back about a half a ball, everything back about a half a ball. And what will happen is it just gives you a little bit more confidence, a little bit more trust that you're going to be able to, to hit that ball. Here's the problem, though. Mentally, what happens to you when you're on a tight lie is your tendency is to fall back and try to help this ball get up into the air. And so what I would try to do is what I would be thinking, let's assume that you're a right-handed golfer. What I would be trying to do is I would be trying to get my trail shoulder past the ball before I struck the ball. And when you start to do this, now all of a sudden you're not falling backwards. So if my trail shoulder, my right shoulder, if I try to help this up into the air, it's going to drop down to my right knee or, or my right hip. And that's going to be, I got to try to help this get up into the air. Well, in order for us to be able to eliminate that, we got to make sure that that, that shoulder isn't going down and back, but it's actually going forward. Well, if it goes forward, it'll stay high. You're not going to go like this. You're going to go like this. So I just take the ball, move it a little bit back in the stance, about a half a ball. And then I really focus on the trail shoulder, moving it forward. And when I move it forward, I'm going to get the strike. It's going to come out lower. That one there launched at about 16, seven. It's going to come out lower, but it's going to come out. You're going to hit it solidly. So that would be one of the things that, that, that I would suggest doing. Pay attention to what's happening with your trail shoulder. Okay. And you can also think lead shoulder. Lead shoulder has to go down at that point. You got to make sure it's going down and back, which will move that trail shoulder high and forward. So those would be, I'd be, I would be, I would be thinking a little bit more upper body, move the ball back, get your upper body a little bit more active and you won't have to fear that, that tight lie. This one's from Rick. You're going to love this. How do I fix my inconsistency? I will slice a drive and then follow it with a hook on my next drive. On the next drive. Yeah. Yeah. This is exactly, this is exactly what we talked about. The reason why you're getting inconsistencies in the shot shape is you're getting inconsistencies in the club face. So club face is active and bodies are passive. And so what, what, I, would, what I would recommend is learning how to swing a golf club, hold the club here about, I don't know, a couple of feet down from the, the grip cap, and then swing and don't let this hit you in the in the the side because what you're doing when you get a pull hook and then a slice is you're trying to manipulate the face with your hands and so your body is quiet and your hands are active and all of a sudden you're getting this 
What I want you to do is I want you to get this. So you go here. How does that happen? Well, go pull it full. It comes from that lead knee again. So if I get the lead knee to go back, now my body is going to rotate. I get that lead knee to push this way, so this way, and all of a sudden, my body is going to rotate. And now I don't have to be quick with my hands. I don't have to worry about trying to close the, the club face, okay? That would be the thing I would tell you. And what I would tell you to practice is, and I know this is going to sound crazy, so I would tell you, go get yourself a, let's say, an eight iron. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take your grip and you're going to make it really, really strong. So you make it so strong that it feels like all it can do is go to the left. And then don't let it go to the left. So you get in here with this strong grip. You go, okay, I'm not letting this go to the left. I'm going to rotate this. I'm going to hold this off right here and not let this go left. So that's a really strong grip that I had with that eight iron. And that golf ball didn't move hard to the left. It had about 450 RPMs to the, to the right side, not to the left side. So I actually got a shot that had fade to it. Now with an eight iron, 450 RPMs of, of right spin, is it going to fade? That's a relatively straight shot. But what didn't happen was it didn't go to the left. And then you start to figure out, well, what did I do to not let it go to the left? Well, I rotated my body. That's exactly what I did. I rotated my body and I didn't let the hands turn over. And now all of a sudden the club face stayed pretty square and the, the shot went fairly straight. That would be what I would tell you to do. That's a great practice drill. Just take it so you feel like everything's going to go to the left and then don't let it go to the left and you'll start to get more active with your body. This is from Jason. Why do I occasionally hit a pop-up with my driver? Of course, two weeks ago, I did it on a water hole. <laughs> well, should, should he use a water ball? That's oh, did you ask that question <laughs> or did he? That sounds like you, you asked that of question. Course. Yeah. No water balls. <laughs> I'm not saying that, like, you don't have to put a new pearl in play, but don't take a donut ball. Do not take the donut ball, okay? All right, now, why do we pop this up? Well, let's assume, first of all, that it's not a T-height thing. Let's assume it's not a T-height thing, okay? Because some people tee the ball up quite high, and you can pop it up that way. Typically, pop-ups are going to happen because the club head is driving down like this. And it's very, very difficult to understand this. So, Gibbsy, give me a three, but give me a close-up on here. So when you close up on this three, what I want you to look is I want you to look at the height from the bottom of the club to the top of the club. I'm just going to make this up. Let's just say that this is two inches. Well, if I'm driving this club down into the ground like this, the difference between the height of the heel and the height of the crown is all of a sudden not two inches anymore. It's shrunk to about an inch. That's how you pop it up. You pop it up by taking the club and driving it into the ground like that. That's how you get the pop-up. Now, how do you get rid of that pop-up? You got to get the club to travel along the ground. And so what you got to imagine, and I don't know if you can take a camera five here, Gibbsy, or not, but bring it right down to the golf ball. And what I want you to imagine, excellent, that's great. What I want you to imagine is that there's a nail right here, and you're going to take the, the club head, and you're going to drive the nail through the ball. The nail isn't going to be like this. The nail is like this. So in your mind's eye, there's a nail that's coming out of this. And I would even set the driver behind that, that club head so that you can almost see the nail. Like in my mind right now, I'm actually, I can see a silver nail about that long with a, a, what do you call the top of the nail? The head? The head. The head of the nail is a fairly, it's a fairly, uh, I'm going to say it's a, it's a quarter of an inch in diameter. So I can see that right there. And what I'm going to do is I'm basically turning my driver into a hammer and I'm going to hammer that nail right through the ball. And when I hammer that right through the ball, now all of a sudden what I get is I get a golf ball that's going to launch out. That one launched out at 11.1 degrees. Had a nice little draw to it. Yeah, there's there you go. Had a nice little draw to it. So what I see is I see the, the nail. Just see the nail. And when you start to see the nail, and you can do this in practice, just see the nail. We all know what a nail looks like. We all have the ability to image a nail in our mind. 
and then just take that nail and put it right there. And if you want to take the nail and twist it so it's going out to the right, then twist it and make it go out to the right. If you want the nail to twist and go to the left, twist and go to the left. But make it be going along the ground, not into the ground. Because when you're getting a pop-up, you're getting the club to go into the ground. And then that nail, all of a sudden, is going to go across the ball instead of through the ball. Okay? And we want the energy of the driver to be going through the ball, not across the ball. Okay, Gregory? This is from Michael. Uh, is there a need to set up a wedge with the face a little bit more open? Is there a need to do that? Yep. Um, gosh, I hate this one because this is like the political answer sometimes <laughs> what I, I the need no you don't need to sometimes you need to and so what i like to do is i like to i like to set you know this i prefer setting the wedge a little bit open when i'm in short shots i i love setting the the um club face a little bit open when i'm trying to add a little bounce to to a wedge, then I'll, then I'll do that. But for the most part, um, it's a situational thing, I guess is the easiest way to say it. I'm not going to necessarily open up the wedge. If I've got a full shot into a green, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that unless I'm trying to take, like I'll open up a wedge. If I'm hitting a shot into a green, if I'm in between. So my pitching wedge will go 135 yards. I want to hit it 120 yards. Well, then I'll open up the wedge and I'll make my, my wedge is 46 degrees of loft. I might make it, you know, and I don't know exactly 49 or 50 degrees, but I'll open it up enough to be able to, to take comfortably 10 or 12 yards off it. And then I can hit it full. Now it's going to have a little bit of a right deflection. It's going to have a little bit of a higher trajectory. Um, and it's going to have a little bit of curve to the, to the right. So if I have a whole location, um, let's just say in the dead center, I'm going to aim a little bit to the left of that whole location to allow for the deflection to the right. And then also a little bit of curve to the right. And it's a little bit of curve to the right. It's not a lot. Okay. This one from Steve, I have a concept issue. I hear swing out to the right all the time. I'm a slicer. If I swing out to the right, how do I get my body around to the left to finish? If all the momentum is going out to the right. Okay, this is a fun one, Steve. So, Gibbsy, I'm going to need a seven here so that everybody can understand. In fact, you know what? I don't need a seven. Greg, will you pull up the, the last shot that we hit that had the path of the golf club uh, coming in? Okay. All right, great. So now I'm going to hit a shot here with this because I'm going to explain this to you. Um, oh, you know what? I got to do it with, a, uh, with an iron because I don't have my – uh, driver taped. So the hardest part to understand about path is paths of golf clubs coming into the golf ball is when you swing out to the right, you're thinking past the golf ball instead of thinking prior to the golf ball. The, the, the club prior to the golf ball affects the golf ball. Okay. So what I would say is instead of thinking swinging out to the right, I would say think of swinging from the inside. So the inside is closer to you. So I want you to think about the club as it's coming into the golf ball, not as it's gone past the golf ball. Because rationally, if you're swinging out this way, it, it, yes, I'm with you. It'd be hard to follow through. Don't think about what's going on past the golf ball. Think about what's happening before the golf ball. So if I want to hit a draw, I have to have the club coming from in here. So I'm, I visualize this path right in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just swing this club from the inside here. And what I'm going to get is I'm going to get when this ball lands and I didn't hit that solidly. So, you know, don't worry about that. But I want you, what I want you to see is I want you to see what, what, what I visualize is this. I don't visualize this past the ball. I visualize coming into the ball. And when you start thinking about coming into the ball, well, then once it, once the ball struck, it can go around. In fact, it will go around. And the reason why, let's go back over here, is when in a camera seven here, or a camera one, when I am swinging the club this way, my body is turning. 
my left shoulder is going that way, which means my left hand is going that way, which means the grip is going that way, which means the club head is going to go that way. So all this is going to go that way regardless of this, as long as I keep rotating. If I stop rotating, I'm not going to be able to swing around. But if I let this club come from the inside, but I keep my rotation, I keep my body going, now what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a, a golf club that's going to come from the inside. I'm going to get a nice full follow through, which is exactly what I got. We come back over here to the, to the club data and that one there, even though that shot went to the left, that club came from the inside, from the inside, not to the outside, but from the inside, 9.0 degrees. Okay. So what I would, what I would ask you to do is, is think about where's the club coming from? Not where's the club going to? Where's the club coming from? Where is the ball going to? So think about the ball and where it's going and the club and where it's coming from. And then you got a chance to, to um, swing all the way through and rotate all the way through. Okay. All right. We've got time for, for a couple more questions. Okay. Um, this is from Ian. I'm putting my net up right now. Hello from Scotland. It's getting dark, but I'll put a spotlight on. All right. Um, when I swing my driver slower, it goes farther. Is this usual? Um, I'm 62 years old, 12 handicap. It, what I would say is this, Ian, first of all, thank you for joining us from Scotland. My Scottish accent is not as good as it used to be. It sometimes it drifts a little bit. It starts out a little bit like William Wallace and then it turns into an absolute. I always like to hear you try. Though. Yeah, it's always it's always fast. It could end up Australian, actually. But regardless of that, um, the reason why when you swing a little bit slower, you hit it a little bit more in the center of the club face. And that's when it goes a little bit. It can go a little bit farther. OK, uh, what I would suggest doing is figuring out how you can just go a little bit, a little bit faster and still find the center of the face. And one of the drills that I love that you can do is you take two tees and you put them on the ground like this. And you create a pathway. So if we've got a camera seven there um, and maybe close up on that, what we do is we have a, a, a nice little pathway right here. You going in there, Gibbsy? Yeah, there you go. So what happens is when I come through here, that's going to invite a center strike, okay? Now, that's fairly generous. So I should be able to move this club through this pathway. And I get a very nice straight shot. That ball literally directly at my target. And the strike, my guess is, is that's going to be pretty much in the center. Yeah, so here we go. So this one here is going to be pretty much in, I think it's right down here. It's pretty much in the center point two. I mean, that's pretty much in the center of, of the, of the golf club. And so what I would do is I would just do this drill, just keep doing this. And then when you get better at it, then make it smaller. And now all of a sudden you got a little, a little bit of a, of a gap to get through, not a lot. And now all of a sudden I should be able to hit this even better. So this one, again, right straight at the target, not a lot of curve to it. Can't wait to see where this strike is. When we come up here, where's the strike? And that one there is 0.1 to the heel. So that little move with that T, all of a sudden I went from 0.2 toe to 0.1 heel. If you're in the points, 1, 0.2, you're going to be okay. So this drill right here is fantastic. And then when you want, if you want, then try to make it even harder. Now, what I would do is I would recommend not doing this with a golf ball, but see how fast you can go through here. So if I go through there at that speed and those tees don't fly, I know I'm going to hit it in the center of the club face. Very, very simple drill. Something that you should do to give you confidence to be able to drive a little bit faster, swing a little bit harder. That drill keeper, okay? Just make sure that when you're setting up all your stuff, over there with the net and everything, that you get a mat that you can put tees into. One of the most important things that you can do. Okay? All right. Okay. This is from Jeff. Do you have time for a 911 on bunker shot? 
yes. took advice last year to open the face and put the left thumb down the top of the shaft. Yeah. He's right-handed. Uh, works great in more compacted sand. In deeper sand, the shot goes maybe six to eight feet. I've worked on finishing high, shallower swing, speed, etc., with no change. What's your advice on deeper sand? Okay, so thicker sand, thicker sand, is it's not going as far. It's going six to eight feet. Okay, so what that tells me is, is that you're very, very steep with what you're doing. In effect, what you got to imagine is, imagine that the, the club has a sock on it, okay? If I have the club traveling along the sand, I have a very, we used to call them in baseball, a sanitary a sanitary is very, very, very thin. I mean, literally, you could see through it. And when you get it really, really steep, and it's got a lot of sand, and now you've got a, a one inch or two inch amount of sand between the ball and the face. Now it's like it's it's like having a boxing glove on your on your wedge. And so what I would tell you to do is you got to create a, a little bit of a shallower angle of attack. Now, how do we do that? This is where. I told you I love these things. This is where, where the gear tie comes in. So what you do is you bend this thing up and you create a little bit of, of this, okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to set this up so that it's behind the golf ball, okay? So you can see that right there. It gives you maybe even a, a – that's perfect. So it's behind the golf ball. Now we're going to twist it open a little bit, and then we're going to move it back a little bit. Now what I have to do is I have to, this club now has to be moving this way. And I would love a close up there of that seven. Yeah. So now what happens is if I move that, now this club has to move parallel to the ground, along the ground here. If I go steep, I'm going to hit it. So I get it moving parallel to the ground. And now all of a sudden, I get no divot whatsoever. And so what you do is you start to teach yourself how to shallow the club. When you get really, really, really thick sand, A, you got to have a wide sole and a lot of bounce. And then B, you got to move that club along the sand so that you're only taking a very shallow amount of sand. Imagine that, that this is kind of coming in like, it's coming in like this. Instead of coming in like this, it's coming in like this. So we take that thing, and this works great in the sand. You can sink it into the sand. So in here, and now it just skims. And what you should get is you should get, if you're practicing on a mat, you should get two bounces. You should hear two noises. It'll be of the, of the mat, and then you'll get another one. So listen for two bounces, two noises. Hear how there's two noises on that? So when you get shallow, and now all of a sudden you start making a, a swing now you won't take as much sand and it'll go it'll go up onto the green you'll have great success all right we got time for one more question here okay this is from rick who asked a question about the inconsistency earlier it's a follow-up um he's a six index just like the inconsistent driving i'm also an inconsistent chipper fat one chip thin the next chip do you have any tips okay so we're just hitting a chip shot that's all we're doing okay yep. all right so there's a couple things. First, I would go to a less lofted club. I right here have an eight iron. I would go with a numbered club. I wouldn't go with a, a wedge. I would go with a numbered club, eight or nine iron, okay? Then what I would do is this. I would stand close to the ball. So down the line in a camera one, I would stand very, very close to the ball like this so that the heel of the golf club, if you could take seven, gives you, yeah, there you go. So the heel of the golf club is in the air. I don't want to have the heel and the toe. I want to have it like that. And then what I want you to do is I just want you to putt. Just putt. And you can let this club glide along the ground. The toe, because it's in the ground, the heel, it's going to slide right along it. You don't have to worry about anything because you don't have two impact points. You just have the, you have the toe in there, not the heel. So when it hits, it's just going to glide. And if you want to open the face, be my guest. So open it up out on the toe, and you're just going to get a very, very nice glide through it. Hold it like a putter. You can see I'm holding it like a putter. I take the index finger of my lead hand, 
run it down the shaft, open it up, and I had, had a nice little chip. And then the final thing that I would tell you to do is this. The point of power in this shot is from the trail hand. And what you want to feel is the trail hand pushing along the ground here. Okay? So we make a stroke and push that along the ground. So we just push. And that push comes from the elbow. We push. And now all of a sudden, we hit the shot that we want to hit. Okay? Okay, a couple of quick reminders again. If you want to get those poker chip ball markers, send an email to me at a new breed of golf at michaelbreed.com. They're only $6. That includes shipping and handling. Specify whether you want blue or black or red or green, whatever it is that you want. The lavender is popular as well. So make sure you, you um, get involved with that. And if you're in the market for a new range finder, or if you're curious about this pin range finder, it's a fantastic product and you get 30 bucks off. So for $200 with the code uh, breed, I think it's just code breed, use code breed, go over to, to pin golf and, and use it. And I'm telling you, no batteries. You don't need batteries. This comes with a little charger that opens up, charge it in there, just like it's a phone, anything else, fabulous device. It's also got a magnet on it so you can stick it to the, to the cart. Just make sure to grab that and put that back into your bag at the end of the round. I want to especially thank uh, Steve Gibbs and Greg Ducharme. Let's wave goodbye to everybody, guys. Okay, there's Have a great Gibbsy weekend, on the everybody. Left. There's uh, Greg Ducharme. So thank you all so much for watching us. Tell your friends about what we're doing. We're going to be here all Fridays helping you play better golf. Love the questions. Love the interaction. And also, too, we're over on SiriusXM every morning, Monday through Friday. Every morning, we also have best of shows on Saturday and Sunday. But every morning, 8 to 10 a.m., fabulous interviews today on that show we had a great lineup including we had martin chuck uh who you might be familiar with with tour striker we also had warren botke as instructors dr brett mccabe dr bob rotella you know a, a lot of the stuff that that he has written so we had a number of fabulous guests including my friend chris finn and of course uh, alec lorenzo with Pin Golf joined us as well to teach you how to use the range finder properly. So if you if you didn't get a chance to listen to that and you're inclined, jump over to that SiriusXM app and uh, listen to that show. It's well worth the listen. A lot of just great instructional information getting you ready for the weekend. That's what we're trying to do in all of our stuff is prepare you for your best golf. We try to make Fridays all about golf that you're going to play, not just what's taking place on the on the tours around here. But for all of us here on A New Breed of Golf, I'm Michael Breed. Thanks so much for watching. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday.